Um, uh, well, good morning, everybody. Um, and welcome to, today, to today's uh, Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission hearing on transnational repression and the U.S. response. I especially want to welcome our witnesses, and I want to thank them for taking the time to uh, share their expertise and their experiences with us today. Many of you may remember the headlines last fall about assassination plots uh, targeting U.S. and Canadian citizens who had migrated from India and were members of the uh, Sikh religion. This meeting is being recorded. Canadian Prime Minister Trudeau publicly stated that his government had credible evidence of involvement by an Indian government official in the June 2023 killing of Hardeep Singh Nijar. In November, the U.S. Department of Justice indicted an unnamed Indian government employee in a foil plot to uh, kill uh, Gurpatwant uh, Panam, uh, a U.S.-based immigration lawyer and Sikh activist. The brazenness of these acts and the alleged involvement of India, a democratic country and U.S. partner, caught many people off guard. But we should not have been surprised. Freedom House and other human rights organizations, including those testifying today, have been raising the alarm about tr transnational repression in the United States and around the world for several years. As of April 2023, Freedom House had documented 854 direct physical incidents committed by 38 governments in 91 countries since 2014. China accounted for the largest number of incidents, but several U.S. allies are among the worst offenders. By transnational repression, or TNR, we mean the practice of governments reaching across national borders to silence criticism and dissent by individuals in, in diaspora and exile communities. The tactics take many forms, stalking, threats, assaults, criminalization, coerced repatriation, pressure on family members, kidnappings and forced disappearances, and even assassination, the tragic killing of Hardeep. These are human rights violations. Victims of these practices include journalists, academics, human rights defenders, people targeted for their religion or ethnic identity, opposition politicians, and family members of, of all of the above. Anyone who criticizes a state's laws, policies, or actions in any way could be at risk. The good news is, the, is that the U.S. government is paying attention to the issue, both domestically and internationally. Federal prosecutors have, have brought criminal charges for acts that fall within the definition of transnational repression. The FBI has a transnational repression information page on its website to make it easier to report incidents. The Transnational Repression Accountability and Prevention Act, um, or the TRAP Act, counters uh, uh, abuse of Interpol notices. In the 2024 NDAA, Congress mandated reporting on acts of TNR in the annual country reports on human rights practices. Sanctions have been imposed against Saudi nationals for the killing of Jamal Khashoggi and individuals connected to Iranian TNR plots. In 2021, the State Department announced a visa sanctions policy, the Khashoggi ban, for individuals engaged in serious extraterritorial counter-dissident activities against journalists activists or other dissidents uh, or their families or close associates. But as we will hear today, more needs to be done, much more needs to be done. And to begin with, there are existing tools that are underused. Last year, I led a request for a, a Government Accountability Office review of federal efforts to address TNR using available tools, including Section 6 of the Arms Export and Control Act. Sex, Section 6 prohibits arms sales to any country found to be engaged in a pattern of intimidation or harassment against individuals in the U.S. The GAO report, which we will submit for the record, found that no determinations have been made under this provision. I am working with Legislative Council to improve Section 6 so that reviews of arms sales related to TNR actually take place. We also know that the existing toolbox is incomplete. Domestically, U.S. agencies lack a common definition of TNR, and there are gaps in U.S. law that hinder prosecution. Internationally, the U.S. lacks a comprehensive coordinated strategy that could increase the impact of our response and facilitate multilateral cooperation. There are pending bills to address these gaps. I'm proud to lead, along with Co-Chair Smith, H.R. 3654, the Transnational Repression Policy Act, which would require an interagency strategy to address TNR at home and abroad. I'm also pleased to co-lead H.R. 5907, the Stop Transnational Repression Act. 
This bill introduced by Representative Adam Schiff, a member of the Human Rights Commission, would address gaps in U.S. law that limit prosecution. So I look forward to hearing our witnesses' thoughts on these bills. And equally important, I want to hear what else is missing and what else we should be doing to stop TNR and to protect its victims. This hearing has attracted a lot of interest. Several statements have already come in from PEN America, the Sikh Coalition, and SALDEF, and we expect more. Uh, and without objection, I move to submit for the record all of the statements we receive. Please be aware that we have our, I, have, I have a hard stop at 11.20 uh, this morning, so uh, we would appreciate if everybody could limit their remarks to five minutes. And with that, I'm happy to yield to my friend, uh, Co-Chair Smith. Thank you very much, uh, Co-Chairman McGovern, and um, it is a delight to work with you on these important human rights issues. You know, late last summer, I met with Eamon B. Rumley, a young man advocating for his father, a prominent Azerbaijani um, economist named Gubad Ibadoglu, who had lived abroad for many years, including in the United States. Last summer, he returned to Azerbaijan to visit his mother and was arrested and imprisoned on patently ridiculous charges of possessing a bag of counterfeit currency. The real reason, he was researching corruption on the part of the dictator of Azerbaijan, Aliyev, and firms linked to President Erdogan of Turkey, and was a leading authority in economic responses to regime corruption. Having met with Aliyev twice in Baku on two, on two separate occasions, two separate years, having personally raised human rights issues with him face to face, and being unbelievably underwhelmed by his responses, uh, I wasn't surprised by how he was treating uh, this individual. So I made a strong statement on behalf of Mr. Ibad de Gulo, um, and his congressional, I am his congressional advocate within our Commission's Defending Freedoms Project. Eamon has been a nonstop advocate for his father, working tirelessly to keep his father's imprisonment in the news and to inform and to rally uh, support. He, his father, frankly, couldn't have such, he must be so proud of his son for being such a tenacious advocate for him. Well, some, sometime in late August 18th, in the early morning hours of August 19th, someone entered the New Jersey house in which Eamon lived and ransacked his room. An investigation is ongoing, but it is clear from other actions of digital harassment and surveillance that Azerbaijani agents or those working on behalf were responsible. This breaking and entering, ransacking, and digital surveillance marks the first known attempt by the Azerbaijani regime to target Azerbaijanis inside the United States. I'd like to add to the hearing record an article by Michael Rubin, who met personally with Eamon and his article, Joe Biden Must Act. Don't let Azerbaijan's regime get away with murder. I'd like to say that these stories of transnational repression are rare, uh, that it's and that it's unusual or common for foreign governments to harm, intimidate, silence, or abduct, or spy on members of the diaspora and exile communities. But it's not rare, not even close. As a legislator who works on human rights issues uh, and meets with regularly with people from China, Turkey, Russia, Egypt, Belarus, Iran, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Vietnam, Cuba, and many, many other countries, uh, uh, I meet regularly with people who are targeted and persecuted by foreign governments that go after them inside the United States. One of the first that I met with was Rabia Kadir. Uh, and I know we've got um, uh, Elfeder here today, and I thank her for being here today. But I remember how she was harassed, how Harry Wu was harassed and, uh, by the Chinese Communist Party and so many others. Uh, and it's, it's ongoing, it's pervasive, and frankly, it is getting worse. I believe our government response to this transnational repression has been very weak. And I agree with my good friend and colleague about you know, the lack of response, that there needs to be a robust response, and the FBI must be much more focused as well. That is why I've authored the Transnational Repression Policy Act, H.R. 3654. It has seven co-sponsors, and I'd especially like to thank my good friend and colleague, uh, Co-Chair McGovern, for being the lead Democratic co-sponsor of that bill. The bill would require the President to impose property and visa-blocking sanctions on foreign individuals and entities that directly engage in transnational repression, and would require the State Department to develop a strategy to fight transnational repression, direct the intelligence community to identify the perpetrators of transnational repression, and the Justice Department to train law enforcement and other employees in detecti detecting and fighting it. 
Yeah, I would point out that you know we 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 haven't done enough. Uh, after the APEC meeting, uh, I had a meeting in this room uh, with many of those who were there protesting, uh, and they were shocked how the Chinese Communist Party all of a sudden there was all these people in mass intimidating, punching, and uh, doing other kinds of acts of repression. Uh, against them, physical violence, uh, and and where were we? What, what did we do to really stop it? Not much, not much at all. So this hearing, I think, will bring a finer point to what we what needs to be done. Uh, and I thank all of our extraordinarily distinguished witnesses for being here. Thank you very much. Uh, and I'll introduce our panel. Um, uh, Nicole Bibbins Sadaka uh, serves as the executive vice president of Freedom House, where she oversees the organization's strategy and programs. She previously served in the United States Department of State, working on democracy promotion, human rights, human trafficking, religious freedom, uh, refugees, and counterterrorism. John Sifton is the Asia Advocacy Director at Human Rights Watch. He focuses on South and Southeast Asia, East Asia, the Middle East, and terrorism and counterterrorism issues world, worldwide. Uh, Tess uh, McInery uh, is Executive Director of the Middle East Democracy Center. Uh, a new 501c3 formed uh, from a merger of the Project on Middle East Democracy and the Freedom Initiative. Uh, she has ad dedicated her career to standing up for U.S. Uh, foreign policy that advances democracy, protects civic space, and defends universal human rights. Francis Wee uh, is, the po is the Policy and Advocacy Coordinator for the Committee for Freedom in Hong Kong Foundation. She currently is based in D.C. We uh, was the first Hong Kong activist to receive asylum uh, in the United States. Uh, Tung uh, Sarada uh, is the chief correspondent at the Cambodia Daily, uh, a Khmer language media outlet that operates in exile. His weekday video talk show includes investigative reports on corruption, money laundering, land grabs, deforestation, human rights abuses, and human trafficking. Uh, El Fadar Il, -ta Il Tabir. Um, is the president of the Uyghur American Association. As the daughter of a distinguished Uyghur writer and journalist, she actively engages with and she supports the Uyghur community, advocating fervently for human rights. Uh, and finally, uh, Abdulhamid uh, Belichi. 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 Yeah, I'm from Massachusetts. English is my second language. <laughs> so um, uh, he is a journalist um, and media executive in exile in the United States. Following political turmoil and government and government opposition, and government sorry, and government oppression of the press in Turkey, before leaving the country, he served as editor in chief of the newspaper Zaman, the largest daily newspaper in Turkey. Um, and we are happy that you are all here. And uh, Ms. Sadaka, we'll begin with you. Thank you very much, Congressman McGovern, Congressman Smith, and members of the commission. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify today. It has been a privilege to work with each of you and certainly your staff who have been wonderful on this issue, and we appreciate your leadership greatly. Transnational oppression occurs when states reach across borders to silence dissent from activists, journalists, and others living in exile by intimidation and violence. And through this repression, states seek to apply abroad the exact same restrictions that they impose at home. It's a threat to the rights of these targeted individuals and communities, but it is a threat to the, our democracy and democracies around the world. It is um, a phenomenon that demands a coordinated response from the United States and other governments. As was mentioned, from 2014 to 2022, uh, Freedom House has collected information on 854 direct physical incidents, assassinations, kidnapping, and other direct uh, physical acts of transnational oppression around the world. 38 governments have committed these acts in 91 countries around the world. And during that time alone, 13 states have engaged in assassinations abroad, and 30 have conducted renditions. We will be releasing a uh, updated database numbers tomorrow at the Munich Security Conference. And what we have been able to do is every year we've been able to add new perpetrator governments and new incidents showing that transnational repression is unfortunately not diminishing. Unsurprisingly, technology has played an enormous role, and you'll hear that from many of our courageous activists and journalists here. Um, it's played an enormous role in the transformation and expansion of transnational oppression. Digital platforms and services have increased the reach of states beyond their border, allowing them to surveil, to track, to harass, 
and, and target individuals through social media platforms and personal devices. According to our database, the top 10 perpetrators of transnational oppression globally are China, Turkey, Tajikistan, Egypt, Russia, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Iran, Belarus, and Rwanda. Together, these 10 countries are responsible for 80% of the cases in our database. And China, which conducts the most comprehensive and sophisticated campaign of transnational oppression in the world, is alone responsible for 30% of these cases. A recent and worrying trend in development is the extraterritorial repression of reporters. We released a report in December cap uh, capturing what this trend is all about. And what we have seen is as a space for free media and dissent is closing in authoritarian countries. Governments are increasingly targeting exiled journalists who continue their courageous work abroad. We know that at least 26 governments have targeted journalists, and of the 854 cases, 112 of them are directly targeted. That's 13% of them directly targeting journalists. Transnational repression is also an everyday threat on US campuses. It's a development that we captured in a recent report that we released last month. What we see is that international students and scholars experience digital and physical surveillance harassment assault, threats, and coercion by proxy, which is when there are harassment of family members that are back home. And unfortunately, very few institutions right now are prepared to address this threat. And the lack of awareness has left targeted individuals to try to deal with the problem themselves and has created a chilling effect in those communities. The impact of transnational oppression on targeted individuals is severe. People's physical safety, their travel, their homes, their online uh, presence and their family's safety are deeply compromised. Each individual incident of transnational oppression produces ripple effects through the community, fostering an atmosphere of fear and su su suspicion among neighbors, compatriots, and activists around the world. Transnational oppression, though, is also a global threat to security and to rights, and it's a challenge for our domestic and our foreign policy. Democratic societies like the United States are challenged to decide if they can and will protect the rights of people inside their borders from such intimidations. We know that autocrats are betting that we will not, and we are not willing to bear the cost of doing so, and we must prove them wrong. There's been strong bipartisan interest in addressing this issue in the United States and a growing interest from our allies in Europe and elsewhere. The current administration has made progress in addressing the issue, and we have five core recommendations that we'd like to uh, put before uh, this conversation today. First is codifying a definition of transnational repression into law. It will be extraordinarily important to have that definition, which will cascade into a number of different actions, and to ensure that necessary legal authorities have, have the necessary legal authorities to sufficiently address this threat work with the executive branch and state and local officials to ensure that those personnel that encounter perpetrators and victims of transnational oppression receive the training needed to recognize and respond and then also assist victims. We need to review current information sharing practices to ensure efficient communication within and between agencies and also with trusted partners and allies. We need to establish clear pathways for exiled human rights defenders, like many of them here, to receive temporary relocation or permanent legal status when needed, providing special visas, such as humanitarian visas or visas for human rights defenders, to help them receive the legal status they need temporarily or permanently. Lastly, we need to urge the executive branch to continue to raise transnational repression as a priority issue with our democratic partners and our allies, including at the highest level of those perpetrators of transnational repression, even when they are close partners such as Saudi Arabia and India. I'll stop here and look forward to our conversation. Thank you again for your leadership. I look well, forward to the Thank you questions. very much for your testimony. Mr. Sifton. Thank you. Thank you for holding this hearing. This is an incredibly, increasingly problematic issue, and the chair and other witnesses have and will define it um, in great detail. Understandably, many US policymakers are particularly concerned with the transnational repression that impacts uh, people on US soil from countries that are more hostile to the US, like China and Russia and Iran, and there are others. And we've documented abuses 
by these countries and others. And we've interviewed the victims and the terrible effects that the repression causes, not only on them, but on the uh, communities they're in. But increasingly, we're also documenting transnational repression by countries that have closer ties to the United States, countries with which the US has economic or security ties. And at this hearing, I want to focus on two countries in particular. Um, although there's information about transnational repression on our website about a host of others, including China. I want to focus on Rwanda and India. The issue of transnational repression by countries with closer ties, like these two, is important because it doesn't receive adequate attention and because it poses more complicated issues to the U.S. Um, as it navigates its responses. I mean, we would request We'd request a committee a place in the evidence the written submission on Rwanda, so I'll skip straight to uh, India. Um, I'm going to focus on India and go into a little further detail. The indictment in New York City has received a lot of attention, as it should, and it contains extraordinarily serious allegations. Uh, but it didn't occur in a vacuum. Um, India, like Rwanda, has close diplomatic ties with the United States which have grown in the last 10 years. But during this period, the human rights situation in India has deteriorated rapidly. And the worsening situation has been well documented in a series of reports, which I linked to in the written version of my testimony. At the center of this deteriorating situation is the ultra-nationalist ideology of the ruling party, the BJP, which is often labeled uh, political opposition, religious minorities, especially Muslims and Christians, as essentially anti-national or enemies of the state. And sometimes this has even included protesting Sikh farmers um, who have been labeled falsely as Sikh separatists. This repression, as we see, is now spilling over India's borders, but we shouldn't just focus on allegations of murder for hire in New York City. The Indian government is also increasingly intimidating people by other means denials of consular services here in the US to Indians in the US on visas, cancellations of overseas citizenship of India cards, OCI cards, which Indian Americans have to ease their travel in India, refusing to allow Indian diaspora to enter the country. I've given many examples of uh, this in my written testimony. Uh, the ruling BJP party is also increasingly using an online troll capacity, troll army, to harass and intimidate critics and journalists overseas, including right here in the US. And I want to highlight the case of Sabrina Siddiqui of the Wall Street Journal. It provides a very explicit example. Last summer during a White House uh, press conference during Prime Minister Modi's visit to, India, uh, to Washington, Siddiqui asked Prime Minister Modi a question about India's deteriorating human rights record. Within hours, she'd come under withering attack from various senior officials in the BJP party, including the head of the BJP's so-called IT cell back in India, which has a record of leading these mass trolling attacks. And a wave of online attacks followed, which had the hallmarks of orchestration by the BJP's IT cell. It included threats, including to kill her, to rape her, to kill her 13-month-old baby among others. And at the height of this attack, tweets about Sabrina were being posted on X, formerly Twitter, at the rate of one per second. This orchestration co constituted conduct which is already criminalized under the federal stalking statute. Siddiqui canceled plans to travel to India later during the G20, during Joe Biden's trip there, due to concerns about security raised by this incident. Now, these are apparent actions by by the Indian government against a US citizen in the United States. But other citizens of Indian origin have faced online attacks and other, Indian, uh, other Indians in America. Um, I have spoken to a lot of both Indian Americans and Indians on visas in the United States and others of South Asian heritage who have spoken of feeling physically unsafe in the United States from these sorts of campaigns, even here in Washington or in New York. 7,000 miles from Delhi. Americans of Indian origin have told me they've changed their behavior. They've kept a lower profile. They've refrained from posting even innocuous comments about India. So that's the victim of the, that's the impact on the victims. I just want to end by talking about the larger uh, effects of transnational oppression like this, not just on freedom of expression generally, which is harms all of us, 
but on the foreign policy capacity of the United States. The transnational repression leads to self-censorship. People can't continue their work. As a result, intended research doesn't happen. Those who wish to report on incidents of abuse here in the United States uh, become justifiably afraid to report them. And this impacts US government interests in promoting human rights abroad. In the case of India, because of this type of repression, information and debate about India's human rights record, and this would also go for Rwanda and other countries, it's stifled. And statements and letters of concern go unwritten by congressional offices. Congressional hearings do not happen. Legislation is not introduced. Proper reviews of military sales, such as the recent uh, notification for the sale of Reaper drones to India, do not occur. Uh, a proper review, a comprehensive review. So in other words, transnational repression harms the ability of the United States and other democratic governments to obtain and craft human rights-oriented policy towards other countries. And as I, as I said at the top, this impacts especially countries with close diplomatic ties with the US, not just India, but also Bahrain and Ethiopia, Thailand. Uh, we will hear about uh, cases involving Cambodia, but Cambodians in Thailand who have been sent back there, as well as uh, Rwanda again. So what can the US Congress do? Well, first, very quickly, one, maintain awareness that transnational repression is not just from hostile governments but also can come from governments with close ties to the US. Secondly, on supporting recently proposed legislation, absolutely, and we do uh, support it, and we urge other members to, to support it as well. Third, just communicate to the State Department that they need to be stronger with governments that have closer ties and send messages to them about the concerns and say there will be consequences not just if one case is investigated or not, but uh, whether the conduct at large changes. Um, in some cases, adopting targeted sanctions for the most egregious cases. Um, and then lastly, in the case of Rwanda especially, it is important to review extradition, legal cooperation, intelligence sharing, um, and especially the honoring of Interpol uh, notices, which. Uh, Rwanda has a record of abusing, and other countries you know, could learn from them and also engage in. So I'll stop there. My written testimony contains a lot more facts. Thank you. Uh, Ms. McInerney? Chairman McGovern, Chairman Smith, members of the commission, thank you for having me here today to testify. It's an honor to be among other colleagues and human rights champions at this important hearing. I cannot overstate or reiterate, like others, how important it is that transnational repression is perpetrated by U.S. adversaries and U.S. partners alike. At the Middle East Democracy Center, a new organization merged from the Project on Middle East Democracy and the Freedom Initiative, we speak daily with people who have experienced transnational repression from countries that are U.S. partners. In fact, the Freedom Initiative published a report last year on transnational repression perpetrated by Egypt and Saudi Arabia, two critical US partner countries, and it identified 52 people who experienced some form of transnational repression here in the United States. Several of my own colleagues in my organization have experienced transnational repression themselves. They have been threatened, they have been physically surveilled, their family members have been unjustly detained, all in an attempt to silence their advocacy, including to this Congress. One of the most horrifying examples of transnational repression is the murder and dismemberment of Jamal Khashoggi, an operation that US intelligence determined was approved by Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. So effectively combating transnational repression requires a robust, multifaceted approach because policies that address digital harassment, for example, will be very different from policies addressing forcible repatriation or murder. Authoritarian governments are also constantly innovating, learning from, and cooperating with one another to find new tools to silence dissidents, journalists, and human rights defenders outside of their borders. And this is especially true for the Middle East and North Africa, where we're seeing the increasing use of the Arab Interior Minister's Council to silence dissent. This council, or the AIMC, is an intra-regional body whose mandate is to combat crime and foster regional security. It essentially operates like 
AMENA-specific Interpol that coordinates extradition between countries. And similar to controversies over Interpol's red notice system, we've seen many concerning examples of politically motivated extraditions by the AIMC. The AIMC has even targeted US citizens. Sharif Osman, a US citizen, was arrested when he went to visit family in the United Arab Emirates in late 2022. The Egyptian government then requested his arrest via the AIMC because he had called for protests in Egypt while he was living in the United States. The UAE decided to arrest him, and fortunately, Sharif was released before he could be extradited to Egypt. So for dissidents and rights activists traveling anywhere in the MENA region, it can be incredibly risky and dangerous because tools like the AIMC are extending the power of authoritarian governments beyond their borders. These governments in the Middle East and North Africa have also heavily relied on spyware to silence dissent. The UAE has surveilled Saudi dissidents by hacking the phones of women's rights defender Lujain al hafoul and the fiance of Jamal Khashoggi. The use of spyware poses an enormous challenge because US law and technology companies are struggling to keep up with ever advancing technology. So transnational oppression is being perpetrated by allies and partners in the Middle East against Americans, including for their right to free speech on US soil. This means that in the United States, the First Amendment has an asterisk appended to it. While Congress shall make no law that abridges the freedom of speech of Americans, authoritarian governments have found ways to do just that. So, given all of this, how can the United States respond? The U.S. government needs to treat transnational repression perpetrated by its partners with the seriousness that it deserves. The recent news that we've covered of a foiled assassination plot of an American citizen that was allegedly directed by another partner and ally, India, reminds us that transnational repression continues to pose a significant risk years after the murder of Jamal Khashoggi. The US government initially responded to Khashoggi's murder with appropriate outrage, but the lack of actual consequences for the crown prince has contributed to a sense of impunity, even for the most egregious instances of transnational repression. And while the US government certainly has different priorities in its relationships with partners than with adversaries, the perception of impunity for US partners cannot be accepted. I strongly urge Congress to do everything it can to ensure that victims receive the justice that they deserve, including support for sanctions and accountability measures and law enforcement action, even if it might be inconvenient for the U.S.'s partners. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to go now to Francis Hui. Now, we may not be, we're not sure whether we're going to make the connection here. And if we don't, then we will go to Mr. Serrata next. But um, I don't know whether. Hello. Yeah, we, we, we can hear you. Uh, can you hear us? Are you guys able to hear me? Yes. OK. Shall I, shall I start? Y yes. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, Chairman McGovern, um, Chairman Smith, and distinguished member and all staff of the commission, thank you for the opportunity to testify before you today. Uh, my name is Francis Hoy, and as you said before, um, in 2021, I became the first Hong Kong activist to secure asylum in the U.S., and two years after that, um, the Hong Kong government placed a mil one million Hong Kong dollar bounty on me for my international advocacy. For decades, the CCP has targeted the Hong Kong communities, Uyghurs, Tibetans, Taiwanese, and Chinese dissidents all around the world. The CCP, as Freedom House has indicated, is carrying out the most sophisticated and comprehensive campaign of transnational repression. Um, I will use my time today to first describe some of my personal experiences as a target of transnational repression carried out by Beijing. Then I will continue, uh, conclude with some suggestions that the United States can adopt to counter the CCP's efforts to silence dissent around the world. The issue of transnational repression is a topic that is deeply personal to me. During the Hong Kong pro-democracy movement in 2019 and 2020, I was a student studying at Emerson College in Boston. 
I coordinated rallies around the world in support of the movement and provided education about the situation in Hong Kong to members of Congress, allies, and the general public. And during this time, I received both physical and online death threats. I also endured harassment and stalking, including being followed to my home and photographed on the streets. Some people threatened to bring firearms to a rally that I organized with other Hong Kongers in Boston, and they mentioned that they are going and planning to shoot me in the face in the rally. Um, in May 2023, the Department of Justice indicted uh, a Chinese-American citizen in Massachusetts, one of the Chinese agents who were tasked with spying on my activities for allegedly acting as an agent of China. In the full indictment, I learned that at multiple events that I organized, he took pictures and videos of me and other um, pro-democracy dissidents and sent them back directly to Beijing officials. And other agents who assisted him had left the country before the government could act. Last year, the Hong Kong authorities issued arrest warrants and a million Hong Kong dollar bounties for the arrest of 13 overseas Hong Kongers, including myself, five of the people are living in the US. And ever since that, the death threats I have received are have been unstoppable. Some of our immediate family members and even in-laws in Hong Kong have been detained for questioning and were used as a means to pass on threatening messages from the authorities to those of us living abroad. The CCP has long used this tactic to intimidate and silence dissidents abroad. Now this is being used against Hong Kong pro-democracy activists. Transnational repression by the Hong Kong government extends beyond its own people. As Jimmy Lai's trial continues, several foreign citizens have been named as co-conspirators, including Ambassador James Cunningham, the board chair of my organization, the Committee for Freedom in Hong Kong Foundation, and a former U.S. Consul General to Hong Kong. China also threatened um, several former and current U.S. Consul Generals to Hong Kong that they might be guilty of contempt of court after they voiced concerns over the city's liberties and Jimmy Lai's trial. And two weeks ago, the Hong Kong government proposed Article 23 legislation to target espionage, state secrets, and foreign influence. And by giving itself the authority to revoke the passports of individuals, the Hong Kong government will likely use this law to abuse Interpol to hunt down dissidents like me. It also make it a crime to hide any information about fugitives, meaning my family and my friends will have to disclose my information about me um, to the police under penalty of prosecution. CCP's act of transnational repression violates Hong Kong's basic law and international treaties. It also threatens the territorial sovereignty of other nations and fundamental human rights. And to counter this, a, a stronger and more robust response from the U.S. is needed to define the consequences of carrying out such acts. This government can first make full use of its sanction authorities to hold bad actors accountable for intimidating and threatening overseas Hong Kongers and do so with multilateral cooperation among allies. Second, prioritize concerns for the CCP's transnational repression in any diplomatic engagements with Chinese counterparts. Third, provide trainings on transnational repression for government officials, including federal, state, and local law enforcement authorities. Um, fourth, encourage Interpol not to implement any request by authoritarian regimes to target political dissidents. And last but not least, pass the Hong Kong Economic and Trade Offices Certification Act to close the offices that are used by the Hong Kong and Chinese governments to monitor the activities of overseas Hong Kongers in the US. Um, I wanna also thank the co-chairs for introducing the Transnational Repression Policy Act, which covers some of the suggestion I mentioned earlier. Um, the, the CFHK Foundation supports the legislation and we look forward to seeing it passed into law. As I come forward to share these personal stories of mine, I want to reaffirm to this commission that the CCP's attempt to silence me will 
only become fuel to my efficacy. I will continue to speak up to protect my community and advocate for those who are unjustly put behind bars. I really appreciate the commission's efforts to shine a light on the Hong Kong freedom movement. And I look forward to working with all of you to address the pressing issues. Thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate your testimony. Uh, Mr. Serrata. Good morning, Mr. Chairman McGowan and Mr. Chairman Smith and the distinguished members of the committee. I am deeply honored to address you today on a matter that not only resonates with me personally, but also touch upon the core of our shared democratic principles. My name is Radha Tang, and I serve as a chief correspondent and anchor for the Cambodia Daily, an independent new organization founded by an American journalist, Bernard Kruscher, in 1993. Once published in Phnom Penh, our newspaper stood as a beacon of independent journalism, often challenging those who sought to quell dissent and stifle freedom of expression. In 2017, in a sweeping move against the opposition and independent media, the Cambodian government and the Cambodian People Party forced the Cambodian Daily to halt its print publication. In response, we took the digital sphere, launching the Cambodian Daily Khmer in the United States to continue our mission to unfettered reporting on Cambodian affairs and diaspora. However, our commitment to truth has come at a great cost. The CPP influence extending even to the United States has placed me and many others in a precarious position. Cambodian Americans who have aligned with the CPP have often done so under the duress of promise or threats threading their voice and safety for access or opportunity in Cambodia. The gravity of this situation was underscored in early June 2023 when Mr. Pai a vocal CPP sympathizer, launched a vid campaign against me following our investigation report on the corruption in Cambodia. This campaign has escalated to direct threats against my life and the safety of my family, both here in the United States and in Cambodia, uh, demonstrating the CPP relentless pursuit to silence its critics without regards for border of the rule of law. Our reporting has illuminated not only the CPP's local transgression, but also its effort to suppress and intimidate the Cambodia diaspora within the United States, revealing a disturbing pattern of transnational repression. This has been further corroborated by the refutable sources, such as Freedom House, the Washington Post, Voice of America, underscoring the growing of concern over the CPP's action against those perceived and adversary. The incident I have detailed today are not isolated, but part of the broader oppressive trend by the CPP that undermines the ability of journalists to report freely and of individuals to express dissent without fear of retribution. This trend poses a significant threat to the democratic value we hold dear and to the principle of freedom of speech that is fundamental to our society. Given these circumstances, I respectfully urge the committee to consider the following recommendation. One, implement target restriction on entry into the United States for individual associate with the Cambodian ruling party who engage in activities that undermine democratic process and human rights. Two, investigate financial transaction from the CPP to entity within the United States to prevent the use of funds in supporting activities contrary to our nation commitment to the human rights and democracy integrity. Three, enhance oversight of the CPP organizational prison in the United States to protect the right of the Cambodian American to free speech and association without fear or intimidation or reprisal. In conclusion, I thank you for your commitment 
to defending human rights and upholding the democratic ideals that define us. Your support is crucial in safeguarding this freedom, not just for Cambodian Americans, but for all who seek refuge and voice in the face of authoritarianism. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Iltabir, welcome. Hi. Um, <laughs> Thank you to the chairs and the members of the Tom Lantus Human Rights Commission for providing me with the opportunity to address the ongoing genocide and the transnational repression faced by Uyghurs, especially the ones in the United States. I am Alfidar Iltabir. I am privileged to serve as the president of Uyghur American Association. It's a community-based uh, organization established 1998. And I aim to shed light on uh, how the ongoing genocide in our homeland, East Turkestan, affecting our daily lives here in the United States. It is already challenging to cope with the anguish of knowing that our families and friends facing physical torture, rape, and enslavement in modern day concentration camps, forced labor factories, and prisons. It's crucial to recognize China's new propaganda endeavors and understand the current stage we are in. China replaces visible checkpoints with high-tech surveillance and relocates Uyghurs from makeshift camps to actual prisons while falsely portraying normalcy in our homeland to the world. Concurrently, China's extraterritorial harassment, including on American soil, has increased in recent years. China persistently violates United States laws to target Uyghurs within the United States, subjecting them to psychological torture by threatening the safety of their relatives to silence criticism of its genocide. Uyghurs in the United States are under surveillance as well. China's state terror transcends borders. We are also victims of the CCP's harassment campaign with this free country. It's brutal for the CCP to physically torture our family back home to inflict psychological torture on us by preventing us from speaking out about its atrocities. China employs tactics akin to kidnappers, targeting us by holding loved ones hostage to compel our compliance with its demands through fear of repercussions on them for our actions. By resorting to such threats and psychological torture, China flagrantly violates American laws with impunity. The decreased number of whistleblowers and the witnesses indicates that the CCP is succeeding with the new tactics of transnational repression worldwide. Here I would like to show a screenshot of a WeChat video that was uh, taken in 2018. Uh, parents live in China of the community members here was fair to speak out about the harassment they faced. And they wrote in a paper and showed during the video call. And I'm going to read this note. The note says, do not attend any events. Events meaning political events or any community events. If you go, uh, um, there are people around you watching and reporting here. If you go to those places, we will be arrested. We sign a document stating you will not participate in anything. This was in 2018, and later on, four members of that family were ar arrested and taken to the concentration camps. Uh, as you see, this is the life of Uyghurs here in, the free, in this free country. I have also faced harassment and threats numerous times. Shortly after I was uh, elected, being elected as the current president of UAA, I received calls from young Uyghur men from another state. Um, according to the young Uyghur man, he informed me that the Chinese police had contacted him, urging him to move to where I live my neighborhood, and monitored who's visiting my house. The man declined, citing difficulty in transferring to another school, but he wanted to caution me to be vigilant, and I was paranoid. 
On another occasion, during a webinar on China's boarding school policy, Chinese trolls registered with fake email addresses and sent harassing messages to me and Dr. Adrian Zenz. My home address was posted online, implying that they knew where I lived. Were they urging other trolls to attack me or further harassment? I don't know. Now I have cameras around my house and I reported everything to FBI. Based on my investigation, most online, account, online accounts that harassed me were created right after I was elected. Most harassments I receive are during Beijing's work hours, especially during the weekdays. And I even noticed that some of them are Google Translate comments because they address me as he sometimes. And the last one, uh, we attended a protest in San Francisco during APEC to demonstrate against genocidal President Xi. We faced harassment there too. Chinese trolls occupied our protest spot, forcing us to retreat and blocking us with the huge flags probably distributed by the Chinese embassy. So no one could see us, so we were almost blocked. They verbally abused Tursunai Ziaudun, an Uyghur camp survivor who is among us today. And they were trying to silence her and verbally abused. Uh, Tursunai Ziaudun was asking me, why American police are not protecting us? We are on the US soil. Mm -hmm. And I had a hard time answering that question. Sheffield Harlem University report on China's transnational repression on the Uyghurs Uyghur diaspora titled, We Know You Better Than You Know Yourself, outlines how the Chinese author uh, authorities employ various tactics, such as surveillance, harassment, coercion, and intimidation to monitor and control Uyghurs. The Chinese government's tra transnational repression violates the fundamental rights of Uyghurs living abroad and undermines the internationally recognized principles of human rights. By targeting dissenters beyond its borders, China seeks to create a climate of intimidation, effectively silencing opposition and perpetuating its authoritarian rule unchecked. Millions of Uyghurs live in detention camps and in open air prison, the mass surveillance police state in our homeland. And we feel like CCP is trying to imprison our minds and soul here in the United States. The world must halt the CCP's long arm from reaching so far beyond China and hold the Chinese government accountable for its atrocities and the genocide. Uh, I believe I passed my time, so I'll leave my recommendation for later. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Mr. Belici. Uh. Chairman McGovern, uh, Chairman Simit, and members of uh, Tom Nantes uh, Human Rights Commission, thank you very much for the great opportunity to testify today on the very important issue of transnational repression. You just make sure everybody has their mics off rather than... All right. So I, I personally experienced both national and transnational repression as a journalist. I was the editor-in-chief of Zaman Daily, which is the largest newspaper in Turkey. Erdogan government brutally raided my newspaper in 2016 March and shut down it in July 2016, together with more than 200 critical media outlets. These are TV stations, newspapers, radios, news agencies. And first thing they did when they took over the newspaper to fire me and appoint a, another editor who converted the newspaper into a government mouthpiece in 24 hours. But the pro readers protested and the circulation declined to 5,000 from 1 million in one week. While uh, getting those threats, uh, I had to leave a country, uh, and I am living in the United States for eight years as an exiled journalist, and was driving for Uber to support my family. I, during that time, I have used all the opportunities to speak out against the repression of the media and have tried to be voice of the silenced journalist and persecuted people at home. 
One such occasion was an event hosted by World Affairs Council in Dayton, Ohio. <coughs> a couple of days before I was prepared to attend that event, I learned that the organizers were threatened by an Erdogan fanatic living in America to cancel the event. The host, my hosts were brave enough not to cancel the event, but I, I had to travel between different events under the police protection in Dayton. And this is happening in American soil. What I am sure is that my case or in Dayton is not unique and not the worst. President Recep Tayyip Erdogan's long arm has reached tens of thousands of Turkish citizens abroad, while Turkey has been experiencing a deepening human rights crisis, especially since the coup attempt in 2016, including his bodyguards attacking protesters in this capital, in Washington, and getting away with it. The State Department's human rights report states that the Turkish government increasingly coordinated with other authoritarian states to forcibly transfer more than 100 Turkish nationals to Turkey in the last eight years and tortured them. Turkey's campaign has targeted all dissidents with liberal, leftist, Kurdish backgrounds, and especially people affiliated with the Hizmet or Gulen movement. The, the movement is globally respected faith-based civil society inspired by Turkish cleric Fethullah Gulen, focusing on promoting interfaith dialogue and education throughout the world. But unfortunately, the government labeled it as a terrorist group and being the main victim of this persecution. Turkish intelligence abducted Selahattin Gulen, who was a teacher in Kenya, and Orhan Inanda, who was also a teacher in Kyrgyzstan. And they published the photos of uh, Mr. Inanda with his broken arm through Turkish media, proudly showing that to the world without any shame. And most recently, they abducted Koray Vural, who was a businessman in Tajikistan. Turkey is also pressuring and sometimes bribing other countries to shut down many successful schools which provide modern education over 150 countries. A letter sent to the Turkish government in 2020 by the responsible UN reporter stating that the systemic practice of state-sponsored extraterritorial abduction and forcible return of Turkish citizens from many countries and condemned uh, the Turkish government. As Jamal Khashoggi, my colleague's assassination in Istanbul shows, the main target of these authoritarian regimes are the journalists, especially the critical ones. Between 2014 and 23, Freedom House recorded 112 incidents of physical transnational repression against journalists perpetrated by 26 countries, including Turkey. Turkey is among the world champions in jailing journalists, we know that. But also, Erdogan government launched an operation to intimidate journalists in exile. Sabah newspaper, which is operated, run by the Erdogan family, has even special reporters to chase journalists in exile. And, uh, they are getting the support of the Turkish spice agency. Recently, they targeted Bülent Kenesh in living in exile in Sweden, who Erdogan asked Sweden to deport in return to accept the NATO's, uh, Sweden's NATO membership. Other journalists that were targeted in European capitals, Cevheri Güven, Abdullah Bozkurt, Ekrem Dumanlı, who lives in America, was chased and taken strictly the photos and uh, exposed the personal private addresses. Ahmet Dönmez attacked in Sweden again. Erik Acerer was attacked in uh, Germany. Adem Yavuzarslan was attacked in DC while reporting, uh, while doing his job as a journalist. Levent Kenez was attacked again in Sweden, who is another exiled journalist. So the photos of most exiled journalists currently appear including myself, at the terrorist, terrorist wanted list of Turkey's 
Interior Ministry. Although we were editor-in-chiefs of ideologically two different newspapers, I and Jan Dündar, now in exile in Germany, are standing side by side on that list, and there is a bounty for our heads by the by the Erdogan government. The list of uh, persecution and repression goes and on, on, on and on. But what can be done and what can Congress do? What can Turkey's democratic allies do? I think there are long list of uh, recommendations, but the most important, most important ones are the Congress and administration can apply global Magnitsky Act who against those officials who are taking part in those torture, abduction, and intimidation efforts of the dissidents. And Turkish jails, while I'm speaking here, are full of the journalists and persecuted academics, lawyers. They, the Congress and administration should use all its power to help those to be released from the, uh, from the jails and uh, express their democratic rights. So uh, th another thing that is very, very important, Exiled media, exiled journalists are targeted because they became an important source of information, information for the millions in Turkey. Because 90% of Turkish media is under Erdogan's control. Because of that, Erdogan is targeting the government of Turkey, targeting the exiled journalists. And the social media platforms are playing a very crucial role, like YouTube. I have a YouTube program, but it is restricted in Turkey. I have a Twitter account with more than 200,000 followers, but it's blocked in Turkey. So the Congress and administration can do something to advise and warn those uh, international and American media companies not to be cooperative with, uh, with the authoritarian governments around the world. I believe these measures could help to bring Turkey back to democracy still and prevent its further slide into the club of authoritarian countries. It must be, because we are not talking about China or Cuba or Iran. We are talking a country which is member of NATO. And it is a shame that a NATO country is among the leading countries, leading actors of national and transnational repression. Thank you very much for all your support, democracy. Well, thank you. Thank you all very much uh, for your testimony. And um, as I said, I, I need to, I have an urgent matter. I have to, I have to uh, leave for shortly. So I just have I just have a few questions and I'll turn over to Co-Chair Smith. and. And uh, we want to thank Mr. Harris uh, for being here as well. Um, you know, I think I think there are a lot of people, not only in this country but in Congress, who view the United States as a safe haven. You know that if you can get to the United States, you know you don't have to worry about um, you know uh, any repercussions um, from a unfriendly government that you may have fled from to to come here. Uh, and yet, uh, as we've Learn, as I've learned uh, over the years, uh, transnational repression is a big deal, and it's growing. Um, and, and it's not just a repression that is spurred on by our adversaries, as, as McInerney mentioned, it's also by our so-called friends. And um, is there any difference in how the U.S. should respond to transnational repression when the country of origin uh, is a U.S. ally, as opposed to uh, a perceived adversary. I mean, I, I worry sometimes we have a double standard, right, when it, on, on human rights. Um, and, um, you know, it's, uh, you know, I mean, I, I think what China is doing is horrific, and, um, and, and, the, and, and especially with the Uyghurs and, and to, to, to Tibetans in particular. Um, but, um, and, we, and we are less shy about speaking out against China as we are, uh, as opposed to, some of our allies, I mean, Saudi Arabia in particular, after what they did. But I'm just wondering, is, does anyone here believe that, that there should be, you know, two rules, one when it comes to our adversaries or one when it comes to our allies? I'd be happy to jump yeah. in on that. Um, a crime is a crime, and the punishment is the same regardless because it is a 
denial of freedom, it's a denial of, um, it, you know, it's a commission of, of a crime. I think the tools are different. Right. Yep. We have very different conversations with Saudi, different access to India, different conversations that are going on. But I think it's important for us, particularly with the countries that we are uh, allied with, to say you don't want to be in the camp. <laughs> with with China and Iran and some of these other countries. So we have a familiarity that we can use. At the same time, we have to draw the line that if there is a commission of a crime on our soil, regardless of who is behind it, it's important for, that we punish it to send a very strong signal that it's unacceptable. I would agree with that. Uh, the opportunities for pressure are different. I think with, with hostile governments, it's essentially punitive. But with allied governments, there are opportunities to withhold uh, various forms of assistance, uh, cooperation, including defense deals and weapons sales, or at least review them, or at least you use the reviews in order to draw more attention to the abuses. But in any case, these are opportunities that you don't have with China, you don't have with Saudi, uh, excuse me, with uh, Russia. Mm -hmm. And those are opportunities which should be taken. So absolutely, there should be no distinction in the rules, but I would flag one issue, it's that every country has its own context. Right. And something that works for one country may not work for another. So I think the Rwanda example is a very good one. We spoke of the FBI being available uh, as a, a tip line to re receive complaints about transnational oppression. We have to recognize that some countries, including some uh, Rwanda, some Rwandans do not feel safe uh, talking to the FBI because they fear, rightly or wrongly, that the FBI is in very close cooperation uh, with the Rwandan government for various reasons. So we have to understand every country, we have a different solution. It has to be nuanced, but the rules have to be, of course, the same for all. Yeah, and this, and this raises some concerns about intelligence sharing, the deals that we have with our allies, and sometimes we have, con we have agreed to banning visas for people um, who, quite frankly, there's no reason to ban their, their travel to the United States. Is any, anyone else want Ms. McInerney? Um, I would agree with John and Nicole that, of course, all countries should be ha held to the right. same standards. That's, in fact, where we often fail, is right. we, in fact, don't hold our allies to the same standards as our adversaries. And I would say this gets to an issue of both U.S. sovereignty and power, is how embarrassing is it to not just the United States' power and reputation, but its ability to serve its own people when we can't protect our own citizens from our friends, right. from our friends abroad. So I think it is a, a vital national security question of aggressively f f trying to figure out strategies for dealing with transnational repression from allies. And our allies, unlike our adversaries, we often have quite a bit of leverage, whether economic deals or security deals, as John mentioned. Yeah. And, and we're really not, I mean, I'm trying to remember amongst our allies where we're reviewing like arms sales um, agreements. Um, I mean, You're under a 30-day notification for arms sales to India for armed uh, Reaper drones, yeah. which are best uh, known in the popular imagination for their use in targeted killings. Right. So it's, the optics are terrible. It's an opportunity right, to yeah. review that. Sarada? Yes, you know, regarding the Cambodian issue that I've been working almost like 20 years covering in Cambodia and in also in America, the problematic that we're facing right now is we, we see the increasing of the Cambodian people network, Cambodian people party, the ruling party in Cambodian networks. It's like spreading almost across the US. So that Cambodian community as a whole, like they they under fear. And those that increase in some state like uh, California, Massachusetts, you know, uh, Oregon and other states, they, they, they kind of just like, uh, uh, trying to manipulate other Cambodian uh, uh, citizens to join the CPP's network, you know. So that lead to what we are facing right now. Because like Mr. Paivana, he 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 even like he talk on on the, his social media. He have a license from Ministry of Information in Cambodia, and he said, if I go back to Cambodia, he would chop off my head right. and. And also he slammed so bad and he's just like talk very angry uh, about my mom, my wife, you know, everything. And then he said he helped his own people in America that can do harm to me at any time. So the cr increasing of the CPP, the ruling party network in America right now, 
it's creating more fear to us. So, so I'm, I'm the first one that really coming out from his voice and send me like two clips. Really, uh, I mean, violently uh, uh, intimidate, you know, against me. That really unacceptable. So, so I mean, the commission, you know, also like uh, the U.S. government should take a look like so seriously into the, the network of CPP. How do they get money to run right. the campaign? Even Prime Minister Hun Sen's come to the U.S., there's a lot of uh, source saying that they were provided with some budget for accommodation, free meals, and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. I would... I would like to just add, regardless of allies or you know adversaries, I believe as soon as we see a crime, we should hold them accountable and take steps, further steps. Otherwise, uh, just like genocidal Xi Jinping is getting away with its genocide and atrocities and then telling those third world countries, look, I am enjoying impunity in UN and still doing this genocide. You know, So I think we should take it more serious and take steps right away. Mr. Bellici? Yeah, I think the different standards for allies and hostiles reduces the power of the democracy message. And there's a world public opinion. You know, when you, when Putin kidnaps an, a dissident or jails a journalist, you speak loudly. But when you keep quiet, when your ally, Turkey, right. does it, so what, what will be the, the impression you are giving to the world, we are giving to the world? So that's very important. I think uh, for, for allies, uh, democratic allies should not be shy to tell right. the mistakes when they do. Yeah. And for Turkey, for instance, you know, Turkey and America are allies for over 60, 70 years. And there are lots of economic and security cooperation, which is nice. Right. But why these are not tied to the human rights and democracy standards? Mm -hmm. So that is, that is the question. And it is possible to encourage Turkey to have good relations with Turkey, whoever is uh, running the country, but at the same time ask them to respect right. rule of law, freedom of media, and democracy. Because if you don't, this will happen again and again and again. I think we wanted to add something. Yeah, well, I, I agree with what everyone said. And I think, um, you know, Congressman, you mentioned that we, um, you know, the U.S. are kind of less shy to speak up uh, against China's human rights abuses. But also, you know, this is more like describing the U.S. Congress. I think, you know, the executive branch has been um, a little vague on this. And uh, we would really want to see a more robust response from the U.S. Um, in regard to the transnational repression carried out by the CCP. Like, you, you know, the, the meeting that Jake Sullivan has with uh, Wang Yi, um, you know, human rights is not like, it doesn't seem like a, it's a priority of their conversation. I mean, we don't really know what's the fine print of the meeting either. But, um, you know, the, when we have diplomatic engagement with China, it should be a priority for us to say this, that this is not acceptable, right? Like transnational repression, threatening family members in Hong Kong, in China, in um, East Turkestan, and you know all these behaviors are not acceptable. And if you do not, um, you know, work with us and and mitigate these actions, then you know it's it's up to the U.S. to take actions. And I I think the U.S. has to be stronger on this and sending a message to China um, about the consequences of giving, you know, for this kind of practice. No, and I agree. And, and, and look, I, I, I think we could all agree that what we're doing is not enough um, and that uh, we, we have some tools that are available to us that we need to utilize better and then we need additional tools. And I'm proud to work with uh, Co-Chair Smith on, on legislation that hopefully can provide some more opportunities. Uh, but it's something we need to talk a, a little bit more about. And I just, you know, I, I also say that, you know, we ought to be looking at these counterterrorism laws that countries are passing, which they use to justify, you know, uh, asking for extraditions or to basically intimidate people. Um, and, uh, you know, and with all due respect, 
uh, you know, uh, to the, all these countries around the world. I mean, targeting journalists is not about counterterrorism. You're going after truth tellers. You know, when you target activists who are raising human rights issues, these are truth tellers. I mean, these are people that, you know, are telling the truth and governments don't like it. It's inconvenient. They feel embarrassed. Sometimes they feel ashamed. Um, and rather than changing their ways or trying to set an example that they can change, you know, they double down on the repression. So, um, and, I'm, and I'm sure that everybody on this panel will get some blowback um, for being on this panel. Uh, but I appreciate it very much, and I uh, and we will stay in touch. And and again, it, it is examples occur if anybody here individually, um, you know, uh, experiences a, additional um, discomfort, or if you're targeted or no others are, that are targeted. I mean, please work with our commission. But uh, I am very very grateful to all of you. This has been an excellent panel. Uh, it's been a big panel, but it's an excellent panel, uh, and uh, and I appreciate it very much. And with that, I'll yield to. Co-Chair Smith. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you all for your extraordinary testimonies. Uh, for some of you, it is at great risk uh, to yourselves and to your families, and that takes enormous courage. And I know our commission deeply appreciates that. I mean, truth tellers speaking out when you know there's a retaliation waiting right around the door is, is the definition of courage. So thank you so much for that. You know, I mentioned in my opening about the um, Azerbaijani young man in my own state of New Jersey and the fact that his father uh, is being um, incarcerated for simply raising terrible corruption issues vis-a-vis -vis Aliyev. Uh, I would remind my colleagues that back when um, Ismail, um, um, Ismail G uh, Ismaji Lova, you might remember her. She was the Radio Free Europe uh, Radio Liberty journalist who was a stringer. She was uh, native as a Bajani. Uh, and when she got arrested for doing uh, background and, and then obviously writing about it, uh, about how corrupt Aliyev is, uh, she got a seven-year prison sentence. So I convened a hearing. We had the head of Radio Free uh, Europe, Radio Liberty, come and testify, as well as uh, human rights organizations. Uh, and she did eventually get out of prison because uh, it was an embarrassment to Baku in a very, very real way. But they go right back and default to somebody else and just move on to another set of victims, which is what they're doing now um, and, and this latest case. So if any of you would want to make any comment about that, I'd, I would appreciate it. Let me also ask you, you know, first of all, on China, uh, I chaired my 99th congressional hearing on human rights abuse in China uh, two weeks ago. We were looking at what happened at the UN Human Rights Council, uh, where China gamed the system, uh, got it to the point where people who were on that board, and many of them were very empathetic to Xi Jinping, regrettably, uh, but they, they, they got it so that when people would be able to speak, they got 45 seconds. I mean, what a, what a, what a, what a, they, you know, there were some very good statements, but 45 seconds and then submissions that hopefully somebody will read somewhere sometime. Um, Xi Jinping, as we all know, is getting away with genocide. Uh, he should be at The Hague for crimes against humanity and for genocide. Instead, he gets feted in San Francisco. And um, you recall, we did have a lot of people here in this room uh, soon after the APEC summit uh, to say, where is the US? Where are the police? to stop the Chinese Communist Party apparatchiks who poured out and were harassing and beating uh, people who were protesting peacefully uh, against that summit. Then we had all these businessmen from the United States rushing, paying huge amounts of money to have dinner with Xi Jinping. He should be in handcuffs. He should be at The Hague. Uh, he should be hand, you know, answering for his crimes against humanity and genocide. And instead, he's being given you know, seven course dinners and, and people pleading with him, kowtowing to him. Uh, I, I just don't get it sometimes. I've been in Congress 44 years. I'm amazed how human rights abuse uh, just continues to grow and our response, especially on the executive branch side, and that's with Republicans too. You know, I was a fierce critic of, of George W. Bush, uh, particularly when with the Olympics and other things. I don't care what party you are. If the White House is not and the State Department not doing their job, we need to speak out and we need to speak out boldly. So uh, on China, you know, we do have the bill. Uh, and I thank you, um, uh, Francis Hui, for talking about the Hong Kong Economic and Trade Office uh, Act, H.R. 1103. It has been marked up. It's waiting to come to the floor. It's my bill. Uh, we think it will pass. 
hopefully it'll pass in the Senate, and it will give the ability to shut down those three outposts of the Chinese Communist Party. And, and in San Francisco, during that APEC summit, that was command central uh, to, to um, uh, bring havoc and harassment uh, to the protesters. It's also, I spent about five, six hours reading all their websites, and they keep defending the national security law, uh, which is a draconian, barbaric law that's been used to put uh, Jimmy Lai and all the others into prison, uh, and, and uh, just a terrible law. And there they're giving this robust defense of that, uh, not surprisingly, but, you know, okay, why is it there? Let's shut it down and let the Chinese Communist Party know that at least that outreach, which is a transnational repression um, outlet for them uh, will no longer be in existence. So that bill should be up shortly, uh, Francis, just to assure you, and uh, we'll keep, and we'll do other things, I hope, as well. Um, let me just say, too, that, you know, on, and, and anyone who would like to further, and, and, and um, I would just say that, Elfadar, uh, your courage is extraordinary. I mean, you have been before the China Commission, of which I chair, um, um, you've been before this commission, um, and and you do it at great risk. And I, I again, I just can't tell you how how in awe I am of that kind of courage. Um, uh, let me just throw out, you know, about uh, India, and thank you, John Sifton, again, for bringing a real focus on India. You know, Modi was the only one on the International Religious Freedom Act, and part of that had a sanctions regime on, on travel. He was the only one who was denied a travel visa because of what he had done vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Muslims. Um, and thank you for bringing out that, that he, uh, you know, if we don't apply the country of particular concern faithfully and based on the record and not based on politics. And I accuse right here from this podium, this administration has done that repeatedly. It did it with India. And I say that about some of the previous administrations as well. Um, call it the way it is. The sanctions part is all yours as an executive branch. You know, it's a two-part thing. We did the same thing with trafficking. Call it right about who's a, a trafficking um, uh, pariah state, tier three as we call it there. Uh, but then hopefully come up with a sanctions regimen or regime that is going to make a difference. And we have not done that with India. Uh, and I did have a hearing just a few uh, weeks ago, months ago, July 18th, the dire state of religious freedom around the world, and we focused on India as well. Uh, and if I'm in, 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 in the Indian government and I see that the Americans don't seem to care about what's happening on the religious freedom side and other issues, trafficking as well, um, you know, and, and then we say next to nothing, if nothing, on the issue of uh, transnational repression. Uh, why are they going to take their cue and say America means business when it comes to these human rights? So uh, you might want to uh, elaborate in a moment or two a little further on that. On Turkey, uh, I am shocked, dismayed, and very, and thanks for bringing up the, uh, the drones, um, uh, uh, too, in terms of trying to be against that. What a message that sends. But on Turkey, uh, to approve a $23 billion, 40 F-16, 79 upgrade kits uh, after they held hostage Sweden, getting into NATO, uh, so that we, we have, you know, affirmed uh, that, that um, uh, and, and said, you know, you hold us hostage on some policy, uh, what do you want? Oh, you want F-16s. I'm dead set against the sale, uh, but it's going to happen. The four corners here in the House and Senate have already said, I'm talking about the committees of jurisdiction, have already given thumbs up uh, just to get Sweden into NATO. Um, I, I just don't know what to say after a while. But, but India, uh, Turkey, I should say, uh, and thank you for coming and, and speaking and for writing, honestly, for all those years. Um, you know, I just, you know, I'm a great believer in newspapers. And, you know, even though I get criticized a lot, um, they are important uh, and really more important than maybe much of what we do because they hopefully bear truth to power. And Sabrina Sadiq, uh, again, getting back to India, um, you know, where, where's the administration on this? Why, you know, when Modi, she, she was at a White House press conference, as was just pointed out a moment ago, and, and, and all this retaliation occurs after that. So, you know, the chilling effect the, uh, is, is appalling. And so this country, uh, the United States, has to become the leader on transnational repression. Thank you, uh, Freedom House. Thank you, uh, Nicole, for pointing out the numbers and giving us the top 10 of egregious violators. I'm sure a number, I'm not sure who number 11 is, but uh, they're competing. 
Right, and, and on Cambodia, thank you, uh, Mr. Serrata, for, for speaking so uh, strongly as well as a journalist. Uh, but there, there are just some of the questions um, and, and comments, any comments you'd like to make on that, um, I would appreciate it. But again, on CPC and on trafficking, um, if we don't get it right there, and we don't, uh, and that is other, other administrations too. During the Obama administration, there were 14 countries that were given upgrades artificially, artificially because of other political issues. Now, that wasn't me talking. I thought it was the case. It was Reuters. They did an investigative report. Three other journalists came forward. I asked them to testify. They said, we're journalists. We don't want to, you know, we're going to keep on that side of the table or the ledger. But boy, did they blow that apart. And I had two hearings on it. I asked the Obama administration, just get it right. Tell the truth. And they weren't. Uh, and they falsified uh, so many of these countries, he gave them artificial upgrades. One of them was Oman, because they facilitated the, the nuclear deal. Um, and another was uh, nearby you. Uh, it was, uh, it was Thai not Thailand, uh, Malaysia, because of the TPP. In order to get in, you had to not be a tier three country. Please, for the sake of the victims, call it the way it is. And that then bleeds right into this whole transnational re repression issue when Erdogan has his thugs beating up people outside the embassy, all caught by CNN and Fox and everybody else on the news. Nothing happens. Um, you know, we show our weakness in a myriad of ways, and it's about time we, you know, we, we just said human rights matter. It's not on page six of our talking points, and, um, and this is an excellent point, transnational repression, for us to really find our voice immediately, um, and, and I do hope we do. So I, I, um, if, if any of you would like to comment on any of that, I would appreciate it, starting with Nicole. Thank you so much for that. And I just have to say a, a, a hearty thank you to, to you and Congressman McGovern for the leadership on the Transnational Repression Policy Act. Passing that will be significant in making progress on this. And I think a big part of that is we really have to define this issue because the more that people understand what the what what is behind the stories that you're hearing from these courageous activists and journalists, um, the more that we will be able to, to have a laser focus on that issue. I do think then that training that comes from it, we define it and then we start training people from our national security agencies down to the local police. I would never expect that a local policeman who's outside of uh, you know the apex summit in San Francisco even understands all of the dynamics but as soon as we define it and train people we can almost script what's going to happen because we know that China's going to do that we know that Turkey's going to go after journalists like this and so the more that we're able to educate and train those uh, law enforcement and our, our national security apparatus about this will be able to predict and also be ready to respond. I think making this part of our national security conversation is going to be very important as we're making the decisions that John spoke about and others about um, weapons and, and support and intelligence sharing. It's going to be really important that our, our national security apparatus understands that downplaying this issue undermines our security. This isn't one of those nice little human rights issues to put to the side. This is central because if we are partnering with and we're strengthening regimes that are then coming and playing on our soil to undermine activists like this, our national security is at threat. So this is really where national security and human rights, which you've always spoken so well about, come together. I'll just also mention um, we're going to be looking um, particularly at this issue of the diplomatic presence in the United States, the fact that we have embassies and consulates here that are part of this problem, we really, they are here as guests in the United States, they have diplomatic relations with us. We really need to look at this issue more closely because if they are part of this problem, they are committing um, violations of our laws and others um, from diplomatic outposts. Um, and then lastly, I just want to commend really lifting up the voices of these activists. They are the ones who are exhibiting courage, which I couldn't do on the best of my days. And so I think that's going to be something that all of us can really partner I'm sure in. you would. Um, no, trust me. I <laughs> They've been through so much, and I really think that it's, it's exceptional because that is also a way that we send a very strong signal that these are people who are the front lines. They are the voices that are representing the best of our values. Yeah, a few things. On the issue of the country of particular concern for international religious freedom, I just to emphasize and get into the record that this bipartisan U.S. Congress-created commission has on multiple occasions recommended not just that India be listed, but that Vietnam for many years has been listed. And 
uh, the politicization of those particular two countries in the State Department designation has been a perennial problem with what is otherwise seems to be an objective process by the State Department with those two countries has gone off the rails, so I, and, and the TIP process with for other reasons. Speaking of TIP, I would notice that um, we haven't talked about Thailand because Thailand is not, uh, has not conducted behavior that has reached the United States of America itself although unless you count the embassy in Bangkok. Uh, and yet, it, as a partner, it has engaged in transnational repression acts, uh, not just with Cambodians, but with um, Burmese and other expatriates, um, even a Russian rock band that was recently there. I mean, they've engaged in transnational uh, repression as well, and as a close non-NATO non -NATO ally, you know, that bears some scrutiny as well. On Azerbaijan, um, I don't want to speak too authoritatively on this, but I believe there is also an arms sale under notification currently, uh, and there have been questions about whether that could be reviewed on human rights grounds and on security grounds. So that's another opportunity. And speaking of that, when we talk about defense agreements, it is sales, which is a great opportunity to raise a lot of questions and demand transparency, but also export agreements. There's a lot of things have moved over to commerce review instead of State Department review, but these are also areas where congressional oversight for these regimes that we've been talking about today is absolutely essential. So not just the big arms sales that get notified, but um, some of the stuff that goes through the door quietly as well. I'm so glad that Francis Hui uh, mentioned the issue of the mixed messaging even with China. I didn't mean to suggest that the United States is somehow adopting a very a strong position on China, but not on India. On the contrary, there's mixed messages with both. And you spoke of uh, APEC. Yes, it was the optics of having um, this leader who is engaged in crimes against humanity uh, talking to US corporate executives and members of the US government without any sort of repercussion or mention about his rights uh, was despicable and a lamentable a spectacle. But it's also true that Prime Minister Modi was there and several other members of the G20 and invited guests who have taken part in some pretty serious abuses. So these, this problem of mixed messages where the State Department spokesperson, the White House spokesperson, will make a statement or allow Sabrina Sadiq to answer, ask a question at a White House press conference and then not actually do anything um, is this mixed message that is so problematic. And last, on um, these issues of U.S., sorry, uh, embassies and consulates here being sort of a forward operating basis for repression, absolutely bears scrutiny. Uh, the for, we haven't talked about the uh, Foreign Asset, uh, Agents Registration Act, but the concern um, that I would flag just there is that we absolutely need more transparency about foreign agent registration acts. But we also have to be cognizant that if that mechanism is over weaponized, then we begin to resemble some of the countries that we complain about over weaponizing their law to go after quote unquote foreign funding. Because there is you know, nefarious foreign funding, but there's also you know, non-nefarious foreign funding, such as USAID funding overseas for civil society. So we have to distinguish this carefully. But also remember that at the end of the day, that is what this is about, not just human rights, but the corrosive impact that this repression has on the decision-making process of the US government. And just like the Foreign Agents Registration Act came into being in 1938 and then was amended by Senator Fulbright in 1962, the purpose is to protect the US Congress from the malign influence of foreign uh, governments reaching into the US, into Washington, and meddling with the operation of the US Congress through either, in the case of uh, Fulbright in the 60s, uh, bribes and corruption, but today through transnational repression. I'm just going to briefly make three sort of interrelated points based on your re remarks, Congressman. And the first is that this essentially is about upholding the global rules-based order. And appropriately, many of us discuss how China and Russia are at the forefront of disrupting, actively interfering at multilateral institutions bilaterally through acts of war and through these acts of transnational repression we've discussed today. And those are critically important. And I think what's also important 
is as we've discussed, many of our allies, many of them in the Middle East, are using the same strategies and tactics as China and Russia to similarly disturb the rules-based order. So when this Congress or the administration or anyone in the U.S. government feels strongly, and I think we do, about a democratic rules-based order, these really existential questions about the future of this world, essentially, is we have to be clear-eyed that many of our friends and allies, many of whom we have leverage over, are behaving in these very similar, frightening ways that we've heard from our brave um, other panelists here today. That's related to my second point, which is you mentioned many times the freedom of expression, media freedom journalists, are the first domino to fall in repression, especially transnational repression. Shutting down the sharing information, corrupting it, making people afraid, self-censoring, all the way to very aggressive, hostile acts, imprisonment, revoking a visa issue of freedom of expression. And so I just wanted to remind us all of an, an example of Abdul Rahman al-Sadan ran an anonymous Twitter account where he criticized the Saudi government. So then Saudi agents infiltrated Twitter itself, his private data among many others uh, were leaked, and Abdul Rahman was disappeared by the Saudi government and then sentenced to 20 years in prison. His sister, Arij al-Sadan, has continued to face transnational repression of her own simply for following up and trying to find out what happened to her brother. So that's an American company in the information ex uh, you know, space, a technology company. Um, eventually, a, a Twitter employee was convicted for his role and sentenced to 42 months in prison. But is that the holistic response we need to this infiltration of the media space in the United States and globally? Um, and then my third, third point is just when we talk about the United States, several of the panelists talk about um, you know, working with federal law enforcement to get them more sensitized about this issue set. The crux of that is building links between law enforcement and the diaspora in the United States and vulnerable vulnerable communities. Many of those vulnerable communities distrust the police, often for very good and, and like practical reasons of things that have happened to them. And so that mistrust, it, it creates sort of an inability for law enforcement and the victims themselves to have a circle of information and enforcement. So not just training, but efforts at a human level to connect law enforcement um, with these groups that they have to protect. Thank you. Um, you know, Mr. Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, Christopher Smith, since 2018 until 2023, when Hun Sen robbed the election, and in 2023, when he robbed another election and gave power to his son, right now, his son has become a prime minister. And the country is just like closing down mostly of the uh, independent media. Right now, we have only... CCIM, the Cambodian Central uh, Media Center, and the Cambodia, the English newspaper, only two uh, uh, that still left in Cambodia. In 2023, before the election, Hun Sen closed down VOD, Voice of Democracy, that I used to work in 2003. And this is the last biggest media outlet in Cambodia that tried to you know, report about the poor, the, about human rights, promote democracy, report about the corruption in Cambodia and all that stuff. Right now, we can see the increase of threat, intimidation against journalists, even against uh, political activists. You can see like in Thailand, last one, uh, Thailand arrests three political uh, activists Right now, they're still locked up and not yet even like uh, sent out of the country from Thailand. And I heard that Thailand are going to deport to Cambodia. So Hun Manet, the, the new prime minister, went to Thailand and say thank you to the new prime minister of Thailand for collaborating. And these arrests have been continued to arrest. <laughs> However, you know, since we, since the independent media cannot be located in Cambodia anymore, and and the poor, the the people, really suffer. They don't they don't have any 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 tool to express uh, their story, you know. Um, so that then only the exiled media outside, like Cambodia Daily, uh, Voice of America, Radio Free Asia, but we it's not enough because the story is a lot of story that happen every day. And we lack of resource uh, to function our uh, 
exam mediator here. For, for Cambodia Daily, we have only two people. So we, we lack of budget, we lack of resource to work. We need more budget, we need more function, we need more anger, you know, to, to and reporter to help us to write story, pick up story, because people really suffer. And so Cambodian government is going uh, against the Paris Peace Agreement. Its constitution is jailing the main opposition party leader, Kam Sokha, arrest and jailing Saint Thierry, the uh, American lawyer. Right now she's still in jail, and she, America doesn't so much intervene to release her like they used to do in North Korea and some other country. So she's, she's still locked up. And the main opposition party leader is still locked up because of, you know, uh, the accused of a uh, traitor, uh, collaborating with, the, with the, the U.S. to overthrow the government. So in this case, when we don't have enough media, enough media outlet, I think the country is, the, the poor, the, pure, the people, the citizen in the country is really suffering even more. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I would like to add uh, one of my recommendations is to use the tools that we have in our hand now. Uh, you introduced the Uyghur Human Rights uh, Policy Act in the House, and we passed the Uyghur Human Rights Policy Act, we passed the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act. By these two bills, we were supposed to sanction the government officials who were linked to Uyghur genocide and atrocities, and there aren't many. Like, we had sanctioned some uh, government officials, but they were with the Magnesky Act. So why are we still waiting when we have the tools, you know? And instead of going forward, we're going backwards. When we heard the, uh, the institution of forensic science uh, were taken out of the entity list by White House, we were very disappointed. This is a genetic surveillance company that links to Chinese government. And in the future, they might be conducting some sort of genetic weapons against the US with the help of US technology. And we are giving up our leverage, giving them the leverage uh, for empty promises, right? So we need to take, stay firm and make sure the Chinese government officials are linked to transnational repression, genocide, and atrocities uh, pay the price. And the other recommendation I have is the expense support and assistance for the Uyghur refugees. There are many asylum seekers in the US. They've been waiting for, to be called for the interview for nine years. And some of them had the interview and waiting for the decision for more than a year and a half. And this shouldn't happen for the people who are already dealing with survivor's guilt, already dealing with transnational repression. They don't feel safe because their status is not clear. And that's why they're afraid to speak out the truth as well. So this is something we can help with to expedite the process of asylum and decision process. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I have um, four points that I'd like to add to my testimony. You know, first, appeasing bullies doesn't help. We should have learned this. In 2013, when the first press cards of my reporters in my newspaper allies, and no big fuss, and now there are bounties over the heads of the journalists, very distinguished, prominent journalists. And the journalists in exile are being targeted and attacked. Can you imagine from 2013 to 23, in 10 years? So appeasing did not help and will never help. Things are getting worse. Look at the relationship between Turkey and the United States. Turkey was an example of rising Muslim democracy in before 2013, and it was a responsible ally. But now, it is one of the only NATO country which is not supporting NATO for the sanctions against Russia, and making bargaining about that very crucial issue. The second thing is the flow of free information is so vital. So these authoritarian governments are destroying democracy, freedom of media, to control the society. So once they achieve that, there is no way to go back. So that is, should be the key point that we should be addressing. Whatever, whatever is the way, 
to connect people with real, true information. So that is very important. If journalists are in jail, if 200 critical media outlets are shut down, how we can expect to have a democracy? It's impossible. And with this 90% of the control by, by the current Turkish government, he can manipulate all the information as, as they like. That's, that's, that's very critical. And the second thing is, you know, administrations can be little real power, uh, national interest oriented. But the parliamentarians, Congress can be more vocal about telling what is good and what is wrong. When a journalist is kidnapped, when a journalist is jailed, I expect a congressperson to speak louder to condemn this, whether it is in Turkey, in China, or wherever. But I don't see that much, that much uh, voice uh, to support uh, freedom of expression and democracy. And uh, lastly, you know, now the Turkey's relations with America turned into very transactional. Turkey asks something, gets something in return. So Turkey used, Erdogan used, Sweden membership for NATO as a bargaining chip to get those F-16s. This is, this is strange, but he was successful. He achieved his goal. So my question is, doesn't America has any bargaining chip to use vis-a-vis -vis Erdogan to get those journalists released from jail? <laughs> Or those lawyers, those political prisoners who have no crime, silly allegations. So I, I, I don't have an answer to that question. I think democratic countries should be smart enough to use their own power. Now, when Russia occupied Ukraine, we saw how democratic world can come together with a big voice. It is possible. I think it is possible to say, to come together against all these national and international repression. There is power, but there should be a will as well. Before going to uh, Francis Way, I think, Tess, you made a good point about inconvenient. You know, the, the inconvenience, frankly, of all human rights issues with the executive branch, and I don't care who, what party is in the White House, uh, is legendary in the negative. Uh, it's always, we saw it after Tiananmen Square when George Herbert Walker Bush sent his national security advisor to assure uh, the Chinese Communist Party that don't worry, nothing, you know, it's not going to interfere with our relationship, which was outrageous. And then when Bill Clinton uh, at first linked human rights by way of executive order on May 26, 1994, he delinked it and said to the Chinese Communist Party, do whatever you want, we just want to trade, uh, but we'll raise some issues, you know, rhetorically with you as we go forward. We, we squander our leverage. The Congress and members of the House and Senate need to speak out, I, I agree, but we also need the executive branch, our ambassadors, DCMs, Foreign Service officers, especially the, the Assistant Secretaries and the Secretary himself and the President and Vice President to have a consistent human rights message, and it's always, always an afterthought. And it's same right now with, with Erdogan. Do you see any linkage to the, the sale of F-16s other than, hey, thanks for letting Sweden get into NATO? Uh, Francis, and now I'm going to yield to our good friend and colleague, uh, 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 Bill Rockus, uh, a commissioner on this commission. But Francis, the floor is yours. Um, first, I wanted to um, thank Congressman Smith. Um, you know, you mentioned the HAETO Certification Act. And um, I, you know, all of us, uh, I can speak on, you know, for the Hong Kong community, um, we all support this um, legislation and we hope that it's going somewhere and, and to see that uh, there would be progress made um, in the near future. Uh, I'm just going to add three points um, to my uh, remarks. I think first, I completely agree with um, out, uh, out of our, um when, when she talked about, um, you know, sanctions mechanism not being used enough. Um, we passed the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Act. We have the Hong Kong Autonomy Act, and we also have the Global Menace Act, all of these tools that we can use to hold 
you know, officials accountable um, for violating human rights and undermining um, rule of law in Hong Kong. But in the past two years, the administration has not issued a single trenches of sanctions in response to the, the situation in Hong Kong. Yet we all know people continue to be sent to jail every day in Hong Kong. Now they put individual bounties on 13 overseas Hong Kongers, including five living in the U.S., Right. One of them is an American citizen. Me personally is, a, is an asylee here in the U.S. who sought refuge um, in, in the U.S. The judges and prosecutors in Hong Kong should be sanctioned. They are responding to jail every day. So I, I strongly encourage members of Congress to support the Hong Kong Sanction Act that was introduced um, to both houses um, with a bipartisan support last year. Um, and, and, you know, this would open uh, the, the opportunity for us to look into um, the judicial system in Hong Kong, which is we have proven that it's no longer independent. Um, second, I mentioned um, briefly about the Article 23 legislation. Uh, we it, it's, it's for sure that the government will use this to control the flow of information. We all know, you know, by China's definition, um, it's state secrets include business information, criticism against the government, uh, all these information about corruption and um, government disclosure, all of these are considered state secrets and they can be suppressed and punished if exposed um, under this law. And um, INGOs with bases in Hong Kong, including non-political ones, um, religious bodies like the Catholic Church and missionaries in Hong Kong, they would all be affected by this new legislation. They will likely have to localize their um, operation and compromise their communication with the foreign bases. And as a Catholic myself, this is very concerning to me because that means the Catholic Church in Hong Kong will have to, perhaps will have to sever ties with the Vatican and follow the path of the church in China where priests are forced to join the state control patriotic association and take oaths of fidelity to the government. Um, and I, I also mentioned about how this law can be used to abuse Interpol to hunt dissidents down like me, right? Like I'm, I'm not in Hong Kong anymore, but they can use this mechanism to hunt us down. Like similar things have happened with thousands of Turkish citizen who had their passport canceled by the government and the government deliberately used Interpol uh, database to circumvent extradition process and evade the, the Interpol's control of notices and diffusion of the city's freedom and human rights. And I, I would say that this new law is to further double down on the repression by introducing even steeper penalties and expanding the cases. Um, and so I, I, again, I strongly recommend the U.S. to pay attention to this law and uh, especially at this very moment before the consultation period ends um, at the end of this month. We really need everyone in the international community to respond to this with concerns and collective actions. Um, last, I would just um, also add the threats that religious communities are facing. Um, the religious communities in Hong Kong um, including those in the diaspora, they're also facing, you know, the threats of sinicization and getting take over by China. Um, uh, related to transnational repression, I would just bring up the example of Father Vincent Wu, who is a priest um, of the Catholic Diocese of Hong Kong. He went on um, uh, the Amer an American Catholic TV network, the uh, EWTN, about how the CCP used re-education and propaganda to stifle freedom of religion in China. And apparently this is also happening in Hong Kong to Hong Kong's religious communities. And after he um, made a, he, he did the video uh, interview, he finished his studies in the US last year and never went back to Hong Kong. So we can all imagine the pressure that he had received from the Hong Kong authorities after the interview. And I mean, he, we, we, Hong Kong priests have always, you know, the, the Catholic Church have always been very outspoken about the human rights abuses in, in China and especially the per persecution in churches in China. And now, it, you know, the church has been, si has been silent and, you know, with a chances of 
people going out and sharing about their concerns, they also receive pressure from Hong Kong authorities and the CCP um, for speaking up. And I think this just shows us, you know, the extent of um, threats that are they're imposing to religious communities and how religious um, freedom is, uh, you know, deteriorating in Hong Kong. Um, I uh, the CFHA Foundation last um, month published this report um, that's called "Hostile Takeover: The CCP and um, Hong Kong's Religious Communities." Um, and in the report, we outline how um, China has taken over the Hong Kong's religious sphere, um, you know, with, you know, imposing threats and silencing um, religious communities. It also includes um, how these um, religious leaders are being used to um, downplay the human rights abuses on Uyghurs in, in, in China. They have used the Muslim communities to do the same thing and, and to glorify um, China in, of what they have done in, 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 in Xinjiang and, and saying that there's nothing, there's no genocide, there's no re-education camp, everyone is happily living in Xinjiang. Um, all of these are uh, very alerting um, signs that the, the, the um, religious freedom in Hong Kong is deteriorating and I recommend um, you know, everyone um, to read the report and to understand you know, the extent of the threats um, in, in Hong Kong. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Wei. I'd like to now recognize um, Mike uh, Bus uh, Gus Bilirakis. I knew his father, Mike, very well as well. Gus. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for all the good work you're doing. You truly are a godsend. And I want to thank the, the panel as well for speaking up. And thank you, Mr. Chairman, for giving them the opportunity to, I, you know, waiving the rules or whatever, to give them an opportunity to expand on their on their testimony, it's so very important. I hope and pray that uh, that the word gets out, and I know it's being telecast in in house by C-SPAN, but hopefully uh, C-SPAN will pick it up uh, nationwide. And thank you to the the journalists as well that will spread the good word um, that we need to make this a priority: human rights and religious freedom. So uh, again, I want to thank Chris Smith and my good friend and uh, James McGovern for holding this hearing today, given the multitude of threats facing Americans and their families worldwide. America was founded by individuals seeking a new life free from persecution. The growing trend of transnational repression, especially from China and Turkey and other countries, is alarming and strikes at the core American values of freedom of expression, belief, and religion. While the issue of the Chinese police stations around the globe really brought this issue to the forefront last year, we need to remain vigilant against malicious foreign agent activity across American institutions, particularly higher education. To that end, I have filed legislation to increase the transparency and accountability of higher education's reporting on student visa fraud and abuse. This is especially critical in wake of recent uh, events. Briefly, uh, Ms. Sadaka, would, would you be able to talk more about how malicious foreign actors have used American education institutions as a platform to monitor and repress, repress students from the diaspora uh, and religious uh, minority communities, please? Absolutely. Thanks for the opportunity to do that, and I'm happy to share the report that we released recently on the um, on the situation of transnational repression on campus. What we know is that our campuses are home to many scholars and students from around the world, and that is a thing which enriches our campuses and it makes our our educational system stronger, and it also makes um, it, it's allowing us to educate people that will then go either back to their country or invest in our country in many wonderful ways. That's but we the intent. That's what, the intent. Well, yeah. yes, but what we also know is that um, malicious, gov undemocratic governments or governments that would like to use transnational oppression find this a, as an ideal place to do that because there are so many students and, and scholars from other countries. And they have targeted many communities across the nation. Um, the challenge is, is there's often a lack of awareness by college 
administrations about this phenomenon and, and, and how then to deal with it and how to secure the students and scholars on their campus. It's in many places. I came from, the, from a university prior to this role, and I know that it is often quite, quite um, it's spoken around in many places where people know that students are targeted, that the Chinese Communist Party is very present on many campuses trying to, trying to intimidate students, also trying to silence. We're having a lot of conversations about free speech on campus. It's an extraordinarily important point. And when we have students who are, are intimidated or scholars who are intimidated to not speak up in the very place where we should have the most rigorous openness about free speech, it is a real undermining of a place where there should be a flourishing of democratic ideals, a flourishing of the freedom of speech. And so what we're really hoping is that college administrators, who I think are, are well inclined to deal with this issue, will be looking at how do we define this issue, how do we train our campus uh, community around this, but also how do we keep our scholars and students safe from it. Thank you very much. Uh, next, I want to focus particularly on Turkey's role in perpetuating the transnational repression. Many of you have probably heard the story of my good friend and human rights activist, Ennis Cantor Freedom. He's really, truly a, a hero. Uh, Ennis's story is a testament to his personal courage and bravery in the face of an autocratic, repressive regime. Last year, the Erdogan regime placed a $10 million lira a bounty on his head because of his criticism of Erdogan. He has been isolated from his family, who while still in Turkey, have faced significant attacks and pressure from the Turkish government due to their connection to Ennis. This is all in an attempt to remove Ennis's criticism of uh, Erdogan's regime one way or another, and he's not going to give up, believe me. He's such a brave individual. This is absolutely unacceptable from an American and NATO ally, more likely, uh, more like ally in name only, in my opinion, and we talked about the, the other issue as well. Also, an issue that's very personal for me is Turkey's repression of the leaderships of Orthodox Christians domestically in an attempt to repress these faiths' ability to act internationally. One example, uh, I'm passionate about is the tragic forced closure of the hockey seminary since, I believe, 1972. It's been closed. This is just one of many instances where the Turkish government has sought to restrict and endanger the organizational futures of numerous Orthodox Christian faiths. Uh, Mr. Uh, Baligi, and I know he touched upon this to a certain extent, for years I have spoken out against the MOU established between Turkey and the United States regarding the cultural heritage. Could you elaborate on the effects of these policies and their impact on people in the United States and uh, diasporas around the world? And again, thank you very much for being here, and thank you for, for speaking out. And again, those in the audience, uh, I, I really appreciate it so very much. Thank you very much. Uh, it was I mean, you told a lot of things that I tried to underline, but you said in a more elegant way. Thank you very much for your My pleasure. Um, points. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, it must not require to be brave to speak up, to speak out. But this is unfortunately the world that we are living in. And, uh, you know, uh, democracy, rule of law, press freedom is a package. So if, if it disappears, it disappears for everyone. So if it disappears for the Hizmet Gulen people, it disappears for the leftist people, for Kurds, for Armenian minority or the Greek Orthodox minority. This is how I look at it. So there should be an increased or turning back to democracy to address all those issues. And the, one of the things that uh, these authoritarian leaders are using to divide the groups in the opposition and play each other against each other. So this, I mean, Turkish people still, half of Turkish society is aspiring for democracy. 
but that 50%, the problem with it is divided. So they all try to protect their own narrow agendas, and they are hardly coming together. So this is the challenge. So if Turkish people with different uh, ideological, religious backgrounds were able to come together 10 years ago, we would not come to that point. Unfortunately, you know, we, we, we maybe had, as a, a newspaper executive, maybe I did some mistakes, not to understand that the persecution of any person would lead to someday persecution of yourself. So that, that is the uh, very important lesson uh, that, that I learned. So if, uh, I mean, it is not, it's not a good approach to cherry pick persecuted segments of society. So, I mean, it is possible to have the Jewish minority have some enjoying rights, but while a majority of Alawites are having issues, it is, it's, not a, it's not a blessing. So there should be a, 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 an understanding of all the society, especially those who are in the opposition, to, to unite uh, and to support each other. Unfortunately, we lacked that feature. In in last uh, local elections in 2019, the Turkish opposition showed that they can come together and they can make a change. You know, they got the uh, municipalities of Istanbul, Ankara, and many big metropolitan cities, which was under Erdogan's party for 20 years. So it is possible still, but now, we are approaching to another uh, local election at the end of the March, and I see very much uh, separated, not unified opposition, which is a challenge. Uh, but, but overall, I think the minority groups are part of Turkish democracy. When Turkish democracy is sick, weak, they also suffer. So the, the, the main point should be to increase standards of democracy for whole country so that the minority groups can also uh, benefit and enjoy the rights and freedoms. Very well put. I, mean, I appreciate it so very much. And uh, Thank you. I don't know if anybody, yeah, this applies to, to all countries. And, and uh, the chairman is right uh, with regard to us delivering the message to the United States. It's, it's more of an afterthought than a priority. And that's been the problem with the, these administrations over the years, and as well as the State Department. So again, we're not gonna give up. Thank you very much, and really, God bless, and uh, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, uh, Commissioner Bilirakis. Just to, to conclude, and if you have anything further you'd like to say, uh, boy, the mic is yours. Uh, but I do wanna just say that we're, we're planning a, a hearing, I'm planning a hearing uh, for mid-April, uh, and his freedom will be one of our uh, it will be our key witness. Uh, he has testified before, uh, not just before our committee, but also others um, on the Hill. Uh, and here's a man who, because he stood up for the Uyghurs and did so boldly and effectively, uh, found himself um, <laughs> thrown out of the NBA. And the NBA, I think, has nothing but shame and cowardice uh, for doing that, we we will we want them to come and testify. Give us a, a reason why you know getting that next deal in in, in communist China uh, eclipses the human rights of an entire group of people. And and I'll go to you in one second, John, if you'd like to say something. Uh, so uh, that'll be in. And I'm wondering, you know, perhaps uh, I shouldn't invite you from the podium here, but Mr. Belici, maybe you'll be available if you could to testify at that hearing because you you bring a whole wealth of insight. Um, uh, as well, and uh, the target date is uh, April 16th, uh, and, and uh, I hope you can do it. Uh, but we've got to bring a bright light on in the region, but especially to his own people. Um, you know, it's just, uh, and we're selling him more F-16s. I, I just don't get it. Let me just also say, uh, you know, uh, uh, Frances Hui, she mentioned um, 
Uh, her fourth point on her recommendations was to encourage Interpol not to implement any requests by authoritarian regimes to target political dissidents. If any of you on the panel would like to um, speak to that, I, and as well as Francis, that's a very, very important part. I am planning on reintroducing the Belarus Democracy Act. We're in the final stages of writing it. Uh, I wrote that in 2004 with a great assist from my staff and input from the human rights community. Uh, and it, it had an impact. Uh, Lukashenko uh, let out a lot of political prisoners. And lo and behold, just like uh, Francis just said with regards to the Hong Kong Human Rights and Democracy Democracy Act. Uh, all of a sudden, you know, the implementation becomes uh, threadbare, the naming of names, the, the denial of visas, and that's where the Magnitsky Act, that was the basis for the Magnitsky Act, that twofold thing, you can't do business, and you're, you're going to uh, um, um, not get a visa to come to the United States. Well, I'll never forget during the Bush years, uh, they were saying, well, he let out the prisoners, now it's time to put this thing into, uh, um, you know, just wave it, don't do it. And I said, what are you talking about? Lukashenko is a monster, uh, and, and we got to keep the pressure applied aggressively and fairly, uh, and, um, and we saw what he did with, with the election, you know, back in August a few years ago, and of course what he's doing vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine. So we're going to be reintroducing that. John, you testified before on Vietnam, before our committee and commission, uh, my subcommittee, and I want to thank you for that. I've tried to get the, 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 the Vietnam Human Rights and Democracy Act passed. It passed the House three times, went over to the Senate, John Curry put a hold on it, and that was the end of it. And now we haven't even got it out of the House. Uh, uh, it has CPC language in that, uh, admonishing the administration to do the country a particular concern. Uh, you've brought out the bloggers and all the, the journalists who have, you know, all the human rights abuses that are occurring. And, you know, we need to speak to allies or perceived allies just like we do the Chinese Communist Party with, with a consistent voice. Uh, so we're trying, and, and it's a bipartisan bill. Zoe Lofgren is my chief Democrat co-sponsor, and it's sitting, it's languishing, uh, because the administration is diametrically opposed to it. And I, I, I find that very disappointing. Um, so if any of you would like to, uh, you know, maybe touch on the Interpol part or anything else that we may have missed, I'll start over here and then work down, if you like. Yeah, thank you very much, Chairman uh, Smith, for the kind invitation. I'll be more than happy well, thank you. to contribute if I can. Uh, uh, it will be a big honor to be at the same podium with NS <laughs> Hero. <laughs> democracy uh, champion. So uh, NS himself became the target of this red notice. You know, they, uh, they, the Erdogan's government conspired to kidnap him while he was transferring from, uh, to, through London, as far as I remember. So this red notice is used, abused indeed, by the authoritarian governments for people who has not no crime. And uh, the lucky part, now the, the red notice, um, uh, the Interpol administration is not taking most of those claims seriously because they are fed up with the accusations of criminal things for the people who had nothing to do with any violence, any terror. They are teachers, journalists, business people, housewives. So, the, I mean, there's a misuse of Interpol. But I think there should be several lessons that could be drawn from this. So if Interpol learned not to take some of the requests of these authoritarian governments, why YouTube, why Google, why Twitter, the, with the new name X, is not acting accordingly? So why they are blocking, for instance, my account? I live in America now. My uh, ex account is blocked in Turkey. So these, I, I raised it a little bit in my testimony. That's very crucial. The, the information companies, media companies, should learn that these governments are illegitimately using their court systems, their governmental authority, authority, political authority against innocent people. So this, they should not cooperate uh, with them. Uh, I, I, I think that that will be an important lesson for all um, trustable, uh, legitimate actors that can help 
to increase uh, the voice of voiceless, not, not to cooperate with the with autocrats to silence them. Thank you. I think I want to touch up a little bit, uh, not just only Interpol, but also like a troll, army troll, that we are really facing right now. And you can see that we do like five days a week of uh, talk show. Uh, this is called Idea Talk. So we invite a lot of uh, civil society group, uh, activists, uh, politician from, you know, in Cambodia and also outside Cambodia, also Cambodian diaspora. Every time we hold a show, for example, like our show is only like one or two K like, but the attack from the troll is about more than 20 to 30 K. Just like slam and consistently attack every day. That we complained that to Meta, to Facebook, and Facebook didn't take any action right now. You can see that uh, in Cambodia, our, our website have already blocked by Hun Sen regime, and Hun Sen is trying to manipulate, the regime is trying to manipulate by creating more events during our live show, prime time. So to divert attention you know, from people from watching uh, independent news through Facebook, YouTube, so that they try to manipulate the audience to another event that they created. They have a systematic create the event. So in this case, you know, it's, it's right now it's very crucial and, 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 and it's, it's, it's hurt the independent media that we do through uh, Facebook, YouTube, and other social media. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Congressman. On your point of Interpol and extradition in general, I mentioned the Arab Interior Ministers Council before, which is like Interpol, with the exception that there are no democracies involved. Um, and this should worry us because autocracies learn and cooperate from one another. Um, governments in the Middle East have deported Uyghurs. Saudi Arabia, the UAE, and Egypt have been complicit in China's crackdown on Uyghur Muslims through detention and refoulement. So this gets back again to the point I made about this is a national security issue, this is a global security issue, this is about authoritarians cooperating with one another. So when are democracies going to cooperate with one another to have a global response to transnational repression? Thank you, and thanks again for inviting me today. A few comments on one of the uh, issues that we brought up, both Turkey and Vietnam, and some other things. But first, on Interpol, I just want to point uh, all members and the committee commission to the written submission by my colleague Louis Mudge on Rwanda, the case of Rwanda exploiting this system, not just for Rwandans in the US, but worldwide is, is a very important one to focus on when, when discussing Interpol. Um, on the issue of Vietnam, I mean, Vietnam is not engaged in much transnational repression here in the United States yet, although there's a recent uh, order to the Ministry of Public Security, the police in Vietnam, that you should probably take a look at because they're now looking like they want to engage in this type of behavior. So we see this is spreading to other countries. But let's just remember, there's another form of transnational repression that impacts uh, U.S. persons, but I hesitate to say that. Human Rights Watch is about humans. U.S. corporations are not humans, so I'm not suggesting they enjoy rights in the same way anyway. But it is undeniable that U.S. companies have faced a form of repression as well. And that is what Facebook faced in Vietnam when they were throttled until they agreed to uh, Vietnam government demands on various regulations. And it's what happened with Singapore about data, data localization and it's happened to Google, it's happened to X. There's other forms of transnational repression. We can think of the Sony hack by North Korea. I mean, these companies have come under attack too. Not always been as courageous as human rights defenders in dealing with it, but that's not the point. The point is that the United States government should also be doing a lot more to protect these corporations from this behavior, not because we care about the corporations, but because it has an impact on the human rights of people who use them. And this is not just uh, the social media companies. We're also talking about studios, streaming companies, and the rest. And then last, on Turkey and India and any closer government to the US which has these arms sales or other agreements, 
I, I just want to emphasize a key procedural point with U.S. congressional oversight that when a deal is announced and notified, it is the beginning of a process which can last years, if not decades. These F-16s are not like a car you drive off the lot and that's it. Uh, they require ongoing servicing, training, and parts servicing that go into decades. So when you sell F-16s, it's basically you're engaging into a contractual engagement, which Congress can uh, exercise oversight on forever. And I think that's an area that needs more exploration, especially as these deals go forward, whether it's on the Dreep Reaper drones to India, the F-16s to Turkey, or any number of other deals or export licenses that go forward. Excellent. I just want to pick up on a couple points and then come to your question about um, Interpol. Um, I think on this point of, of online repression, I think it's one that we're very, very concerned about, and it's an opportunity um, for us to combat the proliferation of spyware. It is something that we're very, very concerned about. Um, restrict the export of surveillance technology, and then also regulate the use of surveillance tools. That is the one of the main ways that many of these authoritarian governments are going after activists and journalists. And we have the opportunity to protect end-to-end -end encryption, because that is really the lifeline of many of our uh, colleagues who are journalists and activists in communicating with each other and getting vital information in. Um, on Interpol, just we'll echo what my colleagues have said, we have an opportunity really to um, educate Interpol and, and to build some transparency for it to be um, a tool of justice and not a tool of authoritarians. Um, DHS did issue some guidelines which said that we should not rely specifically or, or exclusively, I should say, on red notices. It's a step forward, but we have much more to define um, to, to, to train, but then also really to, to test his earlier point, to build a connection between the, the civil society communities that know exactly how this tool is being used with those who are using it. I want to flag one last point, which is we've talked about undemocratic governments and then democratic allies um, both using transnational oppression. We have to keep our eye on how they are also collaborating. We know certainly that Turkey has been re, re, working closely with China when China asks Turkey to send back Uyghurs or others that, um, that uh, China would love to persecute at home. Um, there are countries like Turkey that are more than willing to do that. So that collaboration that's existing between countries that we're allied with and ones that we're not um, is, a, is a significant concern. We have an opportunity to lead. I'm very, very thankful for the Transnational Repression Policy Act and many of the other pieces of legislation which will push the United States forward and, and uh, allow us to really take hold of this, both for the United States, but really for democracy and freedom around the world. Thank you. I'd like to Thank give you. the last word to Francis Way, and then the hearing will be adjourned. Francis. Thank you. Um, I wanted to just um, echo what Nicole uh, just said about, um, you know, the transnational repression happening at U.S. American schools. Um, I personally have been harassed and received death threats from classmates that I actually know and was able to identify. And there was a point that the school administrators uh, had meeting with me and told me that they refused to condemn the action. And the only thing that they said is that, you know, we, we expect all the students to respect First Amendment. Um, it's a freedom um, for everyone to express their um, ideas and thoughts, and they hope that everyone can respect each other. But none of the things that they meant they said was to, you know, condemn these kind of actions and, you know, sending death threats to your classmates and all these kind of stuff. Um, we really need um, schools to set up policy to address transnational repression at American schools and to also train teachers and administrators um, about the issue because a lot of times they don't really understand it and they see it as more like a complicated political issue that's causing controversy um, and it's causing a lot of frustration among um, students uh, on campus uh, when, when they talk about their situation at home, um, the things that they have endured um, all they got was, um, you know, very offensive and disrespectful um, um, response from other students, but then um, they got no support from the school. Um, so this is one thing that I would add to my recommendations. Um, second, I also want to say that, you, you know, 
13 of the people was put on the bounty list um, by the Hong Kong authorities. Um, but the, the, the pressure is not only on um, 13 of us. I think it sends a chilling effect to the entire Hong Kong community um, at large. And uh, we know that after the bounty was issued, there were Hong Kongers from um, in the community. Um, they dropped out uh, from from attending um, events that um, some of us organized and and some of us who are uh, that are attending um, because they're afraid that participating in these um, protests or in in the same occasions with us will put them at risk for associating with with those with bounties. Um, and and uh, they you know the the national security law the subsequent event like um, you know the bounty the questioning of families and friends um, and arresting people who supported um, us financially are all to you know send a chilling effect to Hong Kongers um, in in diaspora and inside of Hong Kong um, and we know one thing for sure that is this would be would not be at the end of this more hong kongers overseas will be put on the wanted list in the future and they will have bounties placed on their uh, for their arrest in the future more people will be subject to legal prosecution and will have to go through the distress of being separated from their family members their loved ones in hong kong and seeing them suffer um, from being questioned, being brought to uh, detention and being interrogated afar. And uh, we all have to live in, they, they, we would all have to live in the constant fear of being assaulted, harassed, and even abducted. Um, and, and so I think one thing that the U.S. Congress can also do to help and support um, people um, from Hong Kong and also others who are oppressed by the CCP is to establish humanitarian pathways for um, for, for us um, to support um, the most persecuted people and those who are in need for a safe haven. Um, I would just end by saying again, thank you very much for um, inviting me and having this uh, opportunity uh, for me to share um, you know, the story of mine and also what the Hong Kong community has endured. Um, we all support, uh, the CFHA Foundation support the Transnational Repression Policy Act, and we um, are looking forward to work together with the commission and um, seeing it passed into law. Thank you very much for um, shining a light on this issue. And yeah, thank you. Francis, <clears throat> thank you so very much. Thank you to our very distinguished panel of experts for your insight, your counsel, um, your passion, your strength, and uh, it does help us all to know what to do and how to do it. So thank you. You're all tremendous leaders. Hearings adjourned. I'll have to ask people to uh, take a lot of the post-hearing conversations out in the hallway. We do, we do have to leave the room more quickly this time. Thanks. <laughs>